So as I was away seeking the Lord, um, shortly, like day number one, the Lord started speaking to me about a new series. And the new series that he was speaking to me about is what we're going to be starting here tonight. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. So the Lord starts speaking to me, giving me, you know, ideas and giving me, you know, insight and wisdom and, you know, just giving me all these different scriptures to use in regards to this one series. So the crazy thing that happened was before the Lord gave me any of the text, he gave me a visual, right? The Lord gave me a visual, he gave me like a vision of what the graphic would look like for the next series. And so... I'm like, uh, okay. And all I saw was the command prompt, which is basically what you guys see, what you guys are seeing uh, on the screen there for the graphic. Or if you've ever seen the graphic on social media, that that old command prompt is what the Lord showed me. And I'm not a programmer. Honestly, I didn't even know there was a new command prompt. I thought it was looking the same way that I got it on the screen now. But uh, it was funny because like I have a lot of friends a lot of brothers that are connected to me that are really good in IT. And some of that includes coding. And I have sisters as well that are good with IT. So I, I'm i like, okay, amen. So I designed the graphic the way the Lord showed me. And I sent, I was super excited because I'm like, I don't know nothing about coding. I don't know anything about, you know, the back ends or the, 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 the bells and whistles, the, the gears and bolts of IT. But I'm just going to send this to a couple of my friends that I know that they know IT and see what their opinion of it is. So I sent it to a brother and I sent it to a sister. Now, the sister responded like she just was like, wow, she was blown away. She was like, mm -hmm, yep, I know that's God. You know, I can't wait to hear these messages that you're going to be preaching because I know this is of God. And I was like, amen. And then the brother who is very... How can I put this? Very precise, very specific about IT. Corrected me. He come back and said, well, you know, Apostle, you know, this is the old command prompt. And it's not the new command prompt. And I'm like, it don't matter. <laughs> this is what the Lord showed me. And so um, as he was saying this, and, and everything is done for a reason, church. This is why I'm trying to the, paint the picture for you. Everything is done for a reason. So as he was saying that, I'm correcting him back and be like, it doesn't matter. And then the Lord start teaching me things. So the Lord said that what is what appears to be old can still be used by God for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we, we, we dismiss something because it appears to be old. It appears to be outdated. It appears to be um, not good to use just because of how old it actually is. But God wanted to remind us that no matter if it's old, if it looks old, or if it is outdated, God can still use it for his glory. Amen. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, it doesn't matter how old it is, God can still use it for his glory. Amen, amen, and amen. Glory to God. Well, church, um, <clears throat> that's how this series came to be about. God spoke it to me. I spoke to a couple of my friends about it. Um, as I've said, I have no knowledge of um, IT stuff, uh, but God has given me the wisdom to be able to teach this series to you. So I want you guys to listen and take notes. Amen. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, take notes. Take notes. Take notes. Amen. Amen. So, glory to God. So, um, we're in this series tonight. We're starting this series, which I'm excited for. And I pray that you guys are just as excited as I am. We're starting this series called Command. Command. Amen. Um, <clears throat> so, let's take a second to talk about command. What does that look like, right? The best way that I can explain this to you is by showing you um, or kind of painting a picture for you to show you how commands work in a computer, all right? Now, I'm just going to throw a disclaimer out there. You ain't got to know anything about computers to listen to this series, okay? 
you ain't got to know nothing about designing software. You ain't got to know about programming or anything like that to listen to this series. Amen. This is just a vehicle that God is using to paint a more vivid picture for us in accordance to his word that we may understand what God is saying. So I don't want you guys to get like freaked out thinking I'm going into all this, uh, you know, all these uh, IT stuff because it, I'm not. Amen. Um, it's just a, a picture that God is using to paint to us to get a more vivid or more clear point out into the open. So, amen. So, anyways, uh, a command prompt. What does a command prompt look like in a computer? Well, um, it's a bunch of code or it's a select or it's different types of codes that you can plug into a command prompt. And as you plug it into the command prompt, the computer will respond or the program will respond. Either the computer or the program will respond. Let me make it more clear and let me make it more plain for you. For those of you, which I'm pretty sure all of us have if we don't still already do so, for those of you that have ever used a Windows PC, there have come times where you may not have been able to close out a program or you may not have been able to close out of a window or you may not have been able to get an application to start whatever that may be uh, whatever that may be you would either have to run the program which was a command that was already established for you all you had to do was click on the start uh, start uh, menu and hit run and then you, the program would run in the disk drive right or you would have to do it manually, meaning you would have to open up the actual command prompt. That was the little window with the black background with the little white text that you would have to type forward slash uh, C dot forward slash underscore and type in your command. Right. So you type in your command and as you type your command in, if it is valid, what would happen is the computer or the program would respond. Amen. That's what a command looks like. That is what a command prompt is. Now, let's make this more relatable to us. <clears throat> so, one thing that God brought to my attention is that we as individuals, we as a people, have a command prompt that is connected to us that was created by God. I'm going to say that again. We have a command prompt that is connected to us that was created by God. In the scriptures, throughout the scriptures, there are many, 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 many different types of commands that God has issued into, uh, issued to us. Amen. There are many commands that God has issued to us. So my question is, if God has commanded us to do something why are we the program? Why are we the people not responding? I ask that again. If God has commanded us to do something, then why are we the program, the people not responding? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because that's exactly what we're going to take a look at throughout this entire series. We're going to take a look at what the commands of God are. And we're going to learn why we can't hear those commands or why we're not responding to those commands. And then in return, we're going to learn how we can be open to those commands and what that will result in our life as we plug in those commands into our life. Amen. Amen and amen. <clears throat> well, before we get into the title for tonight's message. I want us to turn open our Bibles to the Old Testament tonight. And we're going to be reading from the book of Genesis chapter 1. Uh, let me open my thing just to make sure I'm getting the right scripture. I think it's, uh, give me a second. Uh, so open up to the book of Genesis The book of Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Again, that's the book of Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Now, I read from the ESV version of the Holy Bible. 
That's the English Standard Version. However, you can use whatever translation best suits you, uh, whatever be uh, translation you best understand. But for me, I'm going to be reading from the ESV. Um, it may look, the wording may look different, but the general meaning will be the same. Amen. Amen. So again, that's the book of Genesis. That's the very first book in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament, chapter 1. And we're going to be reading verses 26 through 29. Now, once you get there, follow along. But I'm going to go ahead and begin to read. <clears throat> then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over everything or I'm sorry, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. Amen. In this account, we have a vivid picture, a clear picture of when God created both the heavens and the earth and everything within them. Right. So God created the waters. He created the land. He separated them both. He created night and day. He created all that trees, gardens, all that stuff. Right. Then he creates man. <coughs> so he was satisfied with everything else that he had created that far this far. So he's like, you know what? I need somebody to replace Satan because see, Satan was a worshiper. He was an angel, right? He was a worshiper. He had all kinds of musical instruments instilled in his body, but he became deceived because he wanted to be God. He wanted to be worshiped. He wanted to be praised like God. So he deceived a, a good population of the angels in heaven to try to overthrow God. And they all got swept out of heaven, right? And it says in return, he became an ugly thing. He became like an ugly beast or whatever. All right. That's Satan. All right. So then God was like, you know what? So since you won't worship me, since you won't do what I created you to do, I'm going to create a replacement for you that will be 10 times better than you. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, you are 10 times better than your adversary. I'm not talking about the adversary you perceive to have. I'm talking about your real adversary, the devil. Amen. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, you are better than the enemy. Glory to God. You are better than the enemy because you are the replacement of the enemy. You were created in the likeness of God. Don't you understand that there's no angel in heaven? There's no bird. There's no fish. There's nothing that has been created in the image of God. We are the only beings that have been created in the image of God. God. So that is why the enemy doesn't like us. That's why the enemy is out to search, kill, and destroy. That's why the enemy wants to trip us up and disconnect us from God. Because when we become connected to the source of our life, when we become connected to the one whose image we bear, when we become connected to the one that is all powerful, we, hallelujah, we, hallelujah, become powerful. Amen. Glory to God. It's not by my own power. It's not by my own strength. It's not by my own might, but it is only by that in which my father in heaven can give to me. Glory to God. So this is why the enemy doesn't want you to connect to God. This is why the enemy wants to separate you from the Lord. This is why the enemy wants you to be confused. This is why the enemy don't want you to get knowledge. This is why the enemy wants you to stay in the sin that you've been standing in for years and years to come. Amen? Amen. So, this is why, church. Amen. This is why. So God created us in his likeness. Amen. He created us in his likeness. Amen. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, you are created in the likeness of God. Amen. So then 
after he created the man, he looked and he was like, you know what? It's still not done yet. I can't bless it because it's not done yet. That's another thing that I want to point out about God. If it's not finished, he won't bless it. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's not finished, he will not bless it. It's all in the word of God. If it's not finished, he will not bless it. So he looked and he saw the man was lonely. He's like, you know what? I'm going to create for you a wife. Puts the man in a deep sleep, takes a rib from his body, and creates for him a wife. After he saw what he had created, God said, it is good, and he blessed it. Amen. He blessed it because it was now completed. After each thing that God created, he issued a command. After everything that God created, he issued a command. And that command was to what? Can anybody guess? What was the command that God gave? To live. God issued a command to live. This was the first command that God had ever given to the man and the woman that he created in his image was to live, was to live. Even when we are born through our mother's womb, when we are born into the world, the first command that we receive from God is to live. Amen. God provided, after God gave the command to live, God provided everything he has commanded to live. God provided for everything that he commanded to live. He provided for the birds, provided for the fish. He provided for the man and the woman. And here's the crazy thing. In chapter and later in chapter two and going into chapter three, when man and women rebelled against God, he even, even though he was upset, even though his plan wasn't destroyed, but his plan was distorted, it was corrupted. He still made provision for man. But it looked different. Amen. It looked different. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, it looked different. Because see, when sin came into the garden. When sin came into the man, when sin came into the woman, what happened was it threw, it, 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 it brought forth a divide. It brought forth a division between man and God. But God in his mercy, God in his grace, even still made provision for man. It just looked different. God cursed everything when he saw, well, God cursed everything, right? Everything that he saw on the land. But what would you do if I told you that God wasn't really cursing the land. He was basically letting the world know of the corruption that had come upon the land. I'm going to say that again. God was reiterating the corruption that had fallen upon the land. Amen. So that's what a curse is. A curse is corruption that has befallen upon the land. A curse is a, is a form of corruption that has fallen on the land. So this is what happened. Sin came into the picture because the serpent deceived the woman to eat off the tree. And in return, the woman deceived the man to eat off the tree. They both ate off the tree, uh, both having now the knowledge of good and evil. Now sinning against God because God had issued another command to not eat off that tree. God tells them they can eat off of anything in the garden, but they must not eat from the fruit of that one tree. And yet they ate from it anyway, regardless of what the original command was from God. Now pay attention. Follow me. Follow me, church. Follow me. So let's take, let's look at this in a different light. Let's look at this in perspective. Glory to God. God issued a command to live. God made provision for those who he commanded to live. He tells them not, he issues another command telling them not to eat off the tree uh, or off the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden. 
the, not, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then a serpent, a virus, comes along and deceives the woman who now is eating off the tree. Because now what has happened is the woman has been deceived by something other than God. Amen? Let me make it more clear for you. Not saying that God is a deceiver because he's not. Amen? God is not a deceiver. She's listening to a voice that is not God is what I mean. She's listening to a voice that is not God, but yet she wants to be like God, not realizing that she is already like God because she is created in the image and the likeness of God. How do I know this? Because it says in chapter 2 that when man fell from glory, amen, when man fell from God, it says that the, one, the serpent came to the woman saying, eat from the fruit. And she said, no, for God told me not to. And the serpent says, well, yeah, God doesn't want you to because he doesn't want you to be like him. Key word here, be like him. Amen. So what begins to happen is she's like, okay, you know what? She takes the fruit and she bites off of it. And then she deceives her husband to do the same. What has happened is a virus has slept in the back door and now is trying to overwrite the code that God has originally written. It's trying to overwrite the code that God has originally written. That's what a virus does. That's exactly what a virus does. A virus creeps into your computer and overwrites the code with a new code to leak out your personal information, your personal data, and crash your computer all at the same time. That's what a virus does. It overwrites the code into a new code to get you to do a new thing. So what happened was the enemy comes in, the virus, the enemy comes in and tries to override the code that God, override the command that God had initially given to the man and the woman and into all of his creation. So what does a virus do? A virus corrupts. A virus corrupts, and that's exactly what happened at the fall of man and woman. They became corrupt. And in return, the whole program, the whole creation became corrupt. That's why you got murder. That's why you got uh, lust. That's why you got all of these different types of sins in the world today is because what, uh, what had occurred back then. Because of what had occurred back then, it corrupted everything that God had created. Amen. So, again, a virus is something that tries to override the original command and write a new command to get you to do something that is not like God. Something that's not like God. Something that is not like the original command that God had given to you. Amen. Amen. My sermon title tonight is Live. Amen. My sermon title for tonight is Live. Glory to God. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, live. Amen. Make sure you type explanation points behind that. Live. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. So let me ask you a question Are you living or just existing? Are you living or just existing? See, when God first created the world, the first command he issued was to live. And when God first created us, the first command that he gave to us as newborns was to live. Amen? Oftentimes we live our lives out of fear or anxiety or anxiously, right? Right? Have you ever been in a situation, maybe you're currently in a situation where you're operating out of fear or you're operating out of anxiety. You're anxious about something. You know, it's crazy because as I even sit here and think about it and talk to you guys about this, it's evident that there have been times and points in my life where I've become anxious or where I have become fearful and as a result of that, I wasn't able to do that in which God had called or created me to do. Amen. 
Um, the word apostle means one who is sent. The, the word apostle, is, it means one who is sent. And as an apostle, one of my responsibilities, one of my, um, my, one of my, one of the things that God has me to do is travel a lot. But I hadn't been traveling recently because I was fearful. And the one thing that I was fearful of is crime. One thing I was fearful of was um, transportation, money. You know, all of those things became an issue as to why I did not travel. Amen. I remember that there was a time where I where I first started traveling. I had just stepped into the apostolic. And one of the first major trips that I had taken was to Indiana. And um, I went with a dear friend of mine who offered to take me there. And mind you, I had no job at the time. I had no money to be able to pay for this trip. So we took a road trip. We drove all the way from Maryland to Indiana. We made pit stops in Ohio. Um, you know, yeah, we made a pit stop pit stop in a couple places in Ohio and then we went straight out to Indiana and I remember that each step of the way each leg of that trip like when we would run low on money God would resupply amen God would resupply and we got there safely amen there was a snowstorm that because this was in the winter months so there was a snowstorm that had taken place and I remember while we were on the interstate, the snow was just steadily coming down. It was dark. We could barely see. But God got us to where we needed to be safely. Amen. God got us to where we needed to be safely. And I remember just how God provided every, every leg of that trip. God provided. When it seemed like we were getting low, God resupplied. God provided food for us to eat. God provided money for us to use to be able to use that for shelter, be able to use that for gas and so on. Amen. But I remember I was so anxious and so fearful not knowing how we were going to do this with little to no money. But yet God constantly reminded me that he is our provider. Amen. See, our fear and our anxiety gets in the way of what God is trying to do in our life. Fear and anxiety gets in the way of what God is trying to do in our life. When we live our lives out of fear, we hinder God to be able to move in our lives in a way that he intends to, in a way that he wants to. Amen. Are you hindering the flow of God in your life? Are you hindering the move of God in your life? Amen. The word of God says that without faith, it is impossible to be pleasing unto God. And Jesus tells us that even with a very small portion of faith, we can move a mountain. So let me ask you tonight. What is the mountains in your life that is preventing you from seeing the fullness, the faithfulness, the goodness of God? What is the mountains in your life that you need to take what little faith you got and speak to and rebuke it and demand that it be cast away from you, that you may receive the fullness of God, that you may receive the full things that God has set aside and in store for you? you? What mountains are preventing you from seeing your destiny? What mountains are preventing you from seeing the promise of God? What mountains are preventing you from getting to the things that God said he would give to you? Amen. Or let me put it in layman's terms. Let me put it in more modern terms. What is the firewall that is preventing your access to the promises of God? I ask that again. What is the firewall? What is the firewall? What is the thing blocking you, preventing you from getting to the promises of God for your life? Amen. See, I can't rebuke something. I can't bind something up if I don't know what I'm binding up. So if you don't know what's preventing you or what's hindering you, then why not ask God to show you? See, sometimes we, we fail to ask God to reveal things to us because we know he will. And sometimes we don't want to see what God wants to show us. Amen. Because sometimes when God shows us things, it, 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 it calls us to come out of ourselves. It calls us to come out of our flesh. It calls us to come higher. It calls us to come into a higher, newer place. 
that may require to let some things go, including people. Amen. That may require letting some people go, that including, uh, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends. Amen. Glory to God. Sometimes we become so comfortable in our relationships that we're afraid to even let them go, not knowing that God has already prepared something or someone better for us on the other side. Amen. Amen. When we live our lives out of fear, eventually it leads us into anxiety. Fear and anxiety are correlated. Amen. Anxiety is a result of fear. Glory to God. Anxiety reminds us of our fears and disables us to move. Amen. I say that again. Anxiety, amen. Anxiety reminds us of our fear and keeps us in a paralyzed state, preventing us from moving forward in the Lord. Amen. God's command for us to live is much more bigger than we could ever imagine. God's command for you to live is much more bigger than you could imagine. See, I asked the question earlier, are you living or are you just existing? See, a person that just exists, they settle. Amen? A person that just exists, they settle. They're, they just settle. They're content with working at McDonald's. It's getting real in here tonight, church. They're content with working at McDonald's. They're content with the minimum wage pay. They're content with the beat-up car that can barely move. They're content with um, people that mistreat them. They're content with people that abuse them. They're content with the life that they live, but yet that's not the life God called them to live. I know there's, <coughs> excuse me, I know there's a mentality out there and there's even a teaching out there that says that you got to be poor in order to, the more, the more uh, in poverty you are, the more blessed you are by God. That is a lie. Amen. I'm not a prosperity teacher. I'm not. I promise you I'm not. But I will tell you what the word of God says. Amen. The word of God says that God is our provider. The Bible says that God has issued a command for us to live. And after that command was issued, God said, I will supply for you your needs according to my riches and glory. Amen. God is our provider and he never stopped being our provider. The only thing that changed was that instead of us being in a garden where God hand delivered everything to us, now we have to do some things for ourselves. Because remember, he also says in, in Genesis, the land has become hardened and now the man will have to work hard in order to earn his living. But even though I as a man have to earn my living doesn't mean that God doesn't meet me halfway. It doesn't mean that God won't meet me halfway to help me provide for the family that he has blessed me with. So when I tell you that God has always provided for his people, I tell you the truth that God has always provided for his people. And while it may not be in the will of God for you to be a millionaire, for you to be a billionaire, it is in the will of God for you to live an abundant life. My God, it is for you to live an abundant life. Glory to God, the same God who provided for them in the garden is the same God that provides for us today. Even though we have to go out and work the land to get a day's wage, even though we got to put our hands to the plow to work, God is still our provider and he still will make provision for us because it is of his grace and his love and his mercy that we have such things. Come on, people of God. Come on. Amen. So God is calling you out of that, that job. Amen. God is calling you up out of that job that's not paying you a decent wage because it's not about being rich. It's not about being famous. It's about being in the will of God. It's about living and receiving all that God has in store for you. 
God wants you to have a decent job that's going to bless you with a decent wage that you and your family can live comfortable, comfortably. And yes, there will be trials and there will be tribulations that will come upon your household. There will be trials and tribulations that you as a man, women of God have to face, but God will even get you through that and through getting you through the test. Hallelujah. By getting you through the test, he's going to re he's going to strengthen you. He's going to deepen you. He's going to prepare you for what is next in your life. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, he's preparing you for what's next. Glory to God. Hear the word of the Lord and live, my God. Hear the word of the Lord and live. Come out of that job that is calling you in or putting you in a place of mediocrity. Come up out of that pay, hallelujah, and receive a more stable paycheck, my God. Come up out of that. Come up out of that right now in the name of Jesus. And receive all that God has for you. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. It, it, it's not, it may not even be in the will of God for you to live in a mansion. But that's okay. Because the Bible says you have a mansion in heaven. But God doesn't want you to live in a beat up house. He wants you to have nice things, church. He wants you to have decent things. It's why he created it. It's for you to inhabit it. Glory to God. This is why he created, you, created it for you to inhabit it. The Bible says that you shall live in houses that you did not build. You shall uh, reap the harvest from vineyards that you did not even plant. Because this is what God wants for his people. So if the Bible says that I can have this, then why am I not taking it? It's because I'm not living. I'm just existing. It's because I'm not living but I'm just existing. Come up out of McDonald's. If you're in college, that's fine. Stay in college. Get that education so that you can leave that job and get a better job. My God. Come on now. Come on. Stay in college. Stay in high school. Get your diploma. Get your degree. Be all that God created you to be. Well, Apostle, I'm just not smart enough. Well, Apostle, you know, this is a great job. They offer great benefits. But is it blessing you? Is it blessing you? Or is it stressing you? My God. Is it blessing you? Or is it stressing you? Get your diploma. Get your education. Be all that you can be. This is what God wants for you. He wants you to live. And not just exist. Because a life that just exists does not glorify God. Because a life that just exists does not honor God. Because a life that just exists doesn't require faith. I say that again. A life that just exists does not require faith. Therefore, it can never please God. If I have to please God with my faith, but yet I have no faith and I'm living a, just an existent life then I can't glorify God with my life. If your dream, if your vision is not bigger than you, then it's not of God. Get your vision from God. Because when your vision comes from God, it's going to be much bigger than you are. It's going to challenge you. It's going to maybe make you a little bit of afraid. But you rebuke that fear. You grab a hold of what God has put in front of you and let God take you through it and get you to the other side of the mountain. Amen? Amen and amen. Oh, I wish I had somebody to praise God up in this church. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, Lord. Have your way, Holy Spirit. My God. Do me a favor. Turn open with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 6, verse 34. The Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 6, verse 34. Now take your time in getting there, but yet again, once you get there, please make sure that you follow along. The word of the Lord reads, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. These were the words of Jesus. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. Amen. That's another command, church. That's another command that is on top of the initial command that God had given. Live. And when God is when Jesus is saying upon that command to live, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Amen. You have a command, church. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, you have a command. Don't be afraid. For today is its own trouble. 
Today bears its own weight. Today bears its own uh, situations. Why are you worried about the next day when you can't even take care of what's in front of you today? Amen. Stop trying to jump ahead of yourself and take care of your business that needs to be taken care of today. Amen. Glory to God. My God. My, 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 my. God's command for us to live, again, is much bigger than we could have imagined. God says, don't be fearful. Don't be anxious. You don't have to be. Just as God provides for the lilies of the field, and just as God provides for the birds of the air and the fishes of the sea, how much more will your Father in heaven provide for you? All you got to do is ask. You have not because you ask not. When was the last time you petitioned before God, asking him to make provision for you in a certain area of your life? The Bible says that you believe that you receive, it will be done for you. Whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, it will be done for you. Amen. Amen. See, as I said earlier, we were created to replace the enemy. So when we, we pose a, when we live, and no longer just exists. When we live, when we live, we pose a threat to the enemy. For there is a purpose on your life. The enemy knows this. Every person, according to the word of God, has been created for a divine purpose. And even if you don't know what that purpose is, or even if you don't even have an idea of what that purpose looks like, ask God. Go to the Lord, ask him, seek him fast, do whatever it is that you've got to do, but grab a hold of the Lord and don't let go until he answers you. The Bible says for those who seek God with a whole heart, they will find him. Amen. For those who seek God with a whole heart, they will find him. Amen. Amen. So when you live and no longer exist, you pose even more of a threat to the camp of the enemy because the enemy knows that his days are short. His days are numbered and there is a divine purpose, a special gift, a special anointing that God has upon your life for you to inhabit, for you to grab a hold of and run with him that you guys can do even more for the kingdom of God. Amen. When you connect your life to God, you become more, you become that much closer to walking into your God-given purpose. The closer you get to God, the closer you become to fulfilling or getting into your purpose. Amen. My next point is this. Live abundantly. Live abundantly. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, live abundantly. That's a command. Live abundantly. Do me a favor. Turn open to the Gospel of John. Turn open to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. Again, that's the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. <laughs> the Word of God says, <coughs> excuse me, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Again, these are the words of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Jesus tells us two things in this scripture. He tells us that the virus, the enemy, is out to kill, search, and destroy. That's exactly what a virus does. When a virus is sent to your computer, it's out to search for your data, your personal information. It's sent to kill your reputation or sent to kill your computer and destroy what you paid so much money to build up. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. The enemy comes to interfere with the command of God. The enemy comes to interfere with the original command of God. And that is for you to live. The enemy is trying to overwrite the command that God has initially given to you. But the good news is that you don't have to let him. You don't have to allow him. See, a virus is only effective if you don't do nothing about it. But if you see the virus, will you not try to kill it? 
Amen. How do we kill the how do we kill the commands of the enemy? How do we stop the enemy from trying to corrupt the command of God in my life? Well, let's let's take a look here. How, first off, how does the enemy try to overwrite my uh, how does the enemy try to overwrite the command of God in my life? He tries to instill fear. He tries to instill anxiety. He tries to instill all of these ungodly things, sin being the primary at the forefront, right? When the enemy sees that he can't get you to sin against God, then he tries to get you fearful. He tries to get you anxious. Amen. And what sometimes fear and anxiety cause us into sin, leads us into sin against God. Amen. We can overcome these attacks by prayer and standing firm in the word of God. You want to overcome the virus? You want to defeat the virus? I'm going to tell you how. Get back to God. Acknowledge what is trying to come against you and call it out. Remember, whatever you bind up on earth, so shall it be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, so shall it be loosed in heaven. So, once you see the virus, once you see the infestation, once you see what's trying to come up against you, bind it up and go to God in prayer and stand firm upon the word of God. Stand firm upon the word of God. See, the word of God is filled with all kinds of commands. And Jesus is a prime example of how he overcame a virus, the enemy, with the original commands of God. Jesus was fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And as he was in the wilderness fasting, the enemy came to him to tempt him. And out of the various different types of temptation, every time Jesus was tempted, he combated against the temptation, against the virus, with the original command, the word of God. Jesus said, no, for it is written, it is written, it is written. A command is a line of code that is written to perform a certain function. My God, receive it, church. Receive it. A command is a script. The script is the Bible. And it has been issued to you. And when you use it into your life, when you plug it into your life, when you speak the word of God into your life, it will perform a function if you let it. My God. My God. So Jesus used the original script, the original command, the word of God. To combat against the virus, the enemy. Amen. And by doing so, Jesus overcame the temptation. And he passed the test and was able to fully step into his ministry. Amen. Amen. We can overcome these attacks. By prayer and standing firm in the word of God. Quoting the original script, the Bible, into our life. God's word, God's command is supreme and has the authority to dismantle the attacks of the enemy. Amen. When you pray in accordance to the word of God and you proclaim those scriptures and you speak those scriptures over your life, it has the power and the authority to dismantle the workings, the attacks of the enemy. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. My God. So whenever you plug in the command of God into your life, there will be something that will happen. There will be some function that will take place. And the enemy will have no room there because the code of God is plentiful. I tell you the truth that this earth and heaven shall fade away, but the word of God shall never fade away. The word of God is eternal. My God. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. The word of God is eternal. My God. The word of God is everlasting. Heaven and earth will fade away, but the word of God will remain. So if the word of God is eternal, then why am I holding on to someone else's word that is temporary? The enemy's word is temporary. It can easily be dismantled. It can be easily defeated. All you got to do do is grab your code, grab your source, and start speaking the scripture. Start speaking this new script into the, into the system. And watch how God will work it out for you. My God. My God. Woo, Jesus. God desires his people 
to live an abundant life. As we talked about earlier, just existing versus living. He wants you to have an abundant life. An abundant life doesn't mean that everything's going to be handed to you. An abundant life requires you to live faith, live in faith. An abundant life isn't saying that you're going to be rich. An abundant life says you're going to have just enough when you need it. An abundant life is a life where God is in the midst of. I say that again. An abundant life is a life that God is in the midst of. If you're living anything short of an abundant life, then are you really living your life connected to God? I'm going to leave that right there. Amen. The type of life that, <clears throat> that, this is the type of life that can only be accessed through Jesus Christ. An abundant life is the only life that can be accessed through Jesus Christ. Having a personal inner working relationship with him. Amen. The, uh, that abundant life produces a life of joy and happiness. Even in the midst of persecution. Even in the midst of struggles. So are you living that abundant life? Are you living or are you just existing? Amen. Now I'm going to issue this last command to you in regards to living. Get your life back. Get your life back. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, excuse me, neighbor, get your life back. Amen. The best way to identify if the enemy has planted a virus in your life is answering these following questions. Are you mostly happy or are you sad? Are you easily disturbed? Are you fearful all the time or are you anxious all the time? If you answered yes to any of those questions, that is an indication that the enemy is trying to overwrite God's original command for your life. And you need to stop being fearful and you need to stop being anxious and you need to stand up and you need to stand firm on the word of God and start plugging in the original script. Start plugging in the word of God. Start plugging in the command of God into your life and let the spirit of God move in such a way that you get your life back. Amen. Church, how many of you here tonight are taking a stand? How many of you here tonight are getting your life back? I want to know. Say something in the chat. Amen. At this point, it don't matter what people think about you. At this point, you need to stop being prideful. At this point, you need to stop worrying about what the world thinks. At this point, it's you and God. Hallelujah. It's you and God. Hallelujah. So the Lord is asking you tonight to respond. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Lord is asking you tonight to respond. How many of you here tonight are going to get your life back? <clears throat> How many of you here tonight are going to get your life back? How many of you here tonight are going to stop being afraid and stop walking in fear and stop living in fear? How many of you here are going to stop existing and start living? How many of you here are going to stop settling and start achieving? My God, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. How many of you here tonight are going to get your life back? Glory to God. See, you don't have to live your life in fear. You don't have to live your life out of anxiety. You don't have to live your life depressed. You don't have to live your life oppressed. You can have the joy of the Lord in which surpasses all understanding. You can have that peace, glory to God, that only God can give to you. You just got to receive it. Amen. You got to receive it and you got to get rid of that, that nasty virus, the enemy that is trying to override the command of God in your life. You can stop the spread of the virus simply by calling upon the master technician. The master technician is Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Jesus is the access key that can kill any attack from the enemy. My God. Call upon the name of Jesus and live your life within him and through a relationship with him, church. Read the word of God and apply it every day to your life. Stand in agreement with the word of God and declare the blessings of God over your life daily. My God. My God. 
For those of you that struggle with fear. For those of you that struggle with anxiety, read Psalms 118 verses 6 through 7 and declare that over your life each and every day. Again, that Psalms 118 verses 6 through 7, decree and declare that over your life every day. That is the script that is going to overwrite the enemy's virus. Hallelujah. My God, the word of God is the antidote. Hallelujah to the virus that has tried to affect your life. My God. Church, this is the word of the Lord. And the command is to live in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Church, did you receive that word on tonight? If you receive that word, just give God all the praise, give him all the glory and the honor, for he alone is worthy. Amen. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Well, church, I pray that you received it. I surely received it. I was blessed and impacted by it. And I pray that you were blessed and impacted by it as well. As we prepare to close out in worship, I would definitely love to hear from you. Amen. I definitely would love to hear what were some takeaways that you got, got that you guys got from the message. Amen. What were some takeaways that you guys got from the message? What were some questions that you may have had? Um, whatever it is, I want to hear from you. Amen. I don't want you to leave this place without a complete understanding of the word of God. And I don't want you to leave this place without telling me, hallelujah, what were some things that the Lord was speaking to you. Amen. Amen and amen. So before we conclude our worship experience tonight, before I get up off of here, two things are going to occur. Number one. I'm going to close this out in a prayer uh, for those of you that want to commit or recommit your life to Jesus Christ. And then number two, um, we're going to go ahead and close out in worship. And as we close out in worship, uh, we'll go ahead and have a brief moment of fellowship. I'll be in the chat with you guys in that particular moment. But before we go and do that, um, we never like to end a worship experience. We never like to end a broadcast without first giving you the opportunity to get your heart right, to get your life right with God. The Bible says that um, the Bible says that we are sinners by nature and we all have a need for a Lord and Savior. We all have a need for Jesus Christ in our hearts and in our lives. Maybe at one point in time you were a Christian. Maybe at one point in time you did have accepted Christ in your life, but then you backslid. You fell back. Uh, you fell backwards. You started living your life of sin and you departed from God. Maybe you never accepted God in your life. Whatever your situation is, whatever your circumstances are, I invite you to the throne of grace tonight. The Bible says that if we believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, that he died for our sins, and if we profess these things with our mouth, then we shall be saved. The Bible goes on and tells us that whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. So we invite you tonight. If you wish to commit or recommit your life to Jesus Christ, first click on that hand right there in the chat. Let us know that you're committing or recommitting your life to Jesus Christ. Now, don't worry. It's completely anonymous. It doesn't tell us who you are, but <coughs> we would like to know who you are. Amen. So feel free to share with us in the chat if you just made that decision for Christ Jesus or, um, you know, go tell your family member, go tell a neighbor, a friend. Don't worry about what they think about you. Just know that God loves you and his thoughts are the only ones that truly matter. Amen. And then as you click on that banner, we also want you to uh, make sure that you bookmark or that you save that page that appears on your computer screen. As it will inform, it will formally introduce you to who Jesus Christ is as your personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So for those of you that wish to commit or recommit your life to Jesus, again, click on that hand in the chat there and join us in this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I humbly come before you tonight. I confess that I am a sinner, that my sins are many, that my heart is naturally sinful and wicked. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe on the third day that you raised to life and that you ascended into heaven and that you are soon to come back again. Lord Jesus, I repent. I surrender my life in its entirety over to you. And I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. And I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Amen. If you said that simple prayer, I would like to be the first to welcome you to or welcome you back to the family of God. 
let us know that you made that decision, that you took that stand for Jesus Christ on tonight. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, church, with that being said, may God bless you. And may he make his face to shine down upon you. May he lift you up in his countenance. And may you walk, therefore, in a way that is pleasing unto God. I pray that you guys have a blessed and impactful week. And I look forward to seeing you guys on next week for week number two of our command series.